Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we talk to ethnographer Micah van der Ryan of the Samoan Studies Institute. Micah explains what it is to be an ethnographer as he catalogs the legends, history, and customs of everyday life in Samoa. We'll also see excerpts from his documentary about Muliava, otherwise known as Rose Atoll. First, let's meet Micah in his office at the Samoan Studies Institute. The American Samoan Studies Institute is part of the Samoan Community College on Tutuila, the main island of American Samoa. The Samoan islands themselves are in Polynesia, with Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand making up the three points of the Polynesian Triangle. All right, well, this is the work area where I work. It's Ethnographic Media Laboratory. Come on in and take a look. Oh, nice. At the moment, I'm working on a editing, final editing of a film about the Muyava, otherwise known as the Rose Atoll. This video documents the historical, traditional, and cultural importance of Muyava to the people of Manua. It is a place that has supported the community's customary lifestyle for centuries. There are thousands of coral atolls in the Pacific, some smaller than others. Many of the larger ones have human inhabitants, such as this one in Yap, Micronesia. They are formed on coral reefs that have surrounded high volcanic islands, which over the millennia sunk back down below the sea, leaving the reefs behind to continue to grow into atolls. Rose Atoll is thus what remains of an ancient volcanic island. It lies at the eastern end of the Samoan archipelago, which, moving west, consists of Ta'u, Olosenga, Oofu, followed by Aonu'u, Tutuila, Upolu, and Savai'i, with the smaller islands of Manono and Apolima lying between Upolu and Savai'i. These volcanic islands rise at roughly 13 degrees south of the equator and are politically divided between the independent state of Samoa in the west and the United States Territory of American Samoa in the east. Rose Atoll lies 80 miles due east of Ta'u, the largest island of Manua. The two other main islands of Manua are Ofu and Olosenga, which are connected by a bridge. The total land area of Manua equals 51 square kilometers, the majority of which lies on steep slopes behind the coastal villages. The 2010 American Samoa census indicates that less than 1,200 people were living among the five counties and eight villages that constitute the Manua district. American Samoa Department of Education supports three elementary schools and one high school in Manua to serve Manua's children. Those wishing to pursue higher education or employment opportunities not available in Manua must leave for Tutuila and beyond. This pattern has led to a dramatic decline in the local population. Air and ship transport between Tutuila and Manua are limited. Ferry service on the MV Sili is at best once per week. Air transport in small planes is also not reliable. Importing and exporting supplies is a challenge. This means that the people who remain in quieter and more tranquil Manua must enjoy a way of life more reliant on traditional food sources from the sea and land. Most people in Manua participate in fishing, and fish is an important component of the Manua diet. From a young age, most children in Manua learn how to fish. The, the main thrust of what we were trying to document was the oral traditions, the Samoan oral traditions about this particular atoll and why it's important to them. And it's closest to the Manua Islands of American Samoa, which is the eastern group, which has always been a very important part of Samoa altogether. Mm -hmm. So they, they're the ones who have the most important relationship to the atoll. They used to go there, fish there. Um, 
have get pet birds from there. Oh, really? Yeah, they actually, and it was something, it's part of their tradition. They also, um, you know, it was a, important even for the king of Manua as a recreational spot. And there were a lot of interesting traditions, and it was very, very rich. So we wanted to document that, um, and there was both a, a report as well as the documentary film. So we're just finalizing the editing. If you want, we could look at a little clip of it. Some forms of traditional salmon fishing have changed, as reported by one of Manua's fishermen. Meafua is the last of a generation to have used the va'alo, the traditional ponido trolling canoe, which today in American Samoa is relegated to the museum. The motorized modern alia has now completely replaced it. Some traditional manua fishing techniques are still being continued. For example, the use of the enu for the fishing of the iasina, or goldfish, a technique involving this traditional fishing weir, and also the lawatule, the collective fishing of the seasonal mackerel under the direction of a chief fisherman called Matuo Tautai. Using coconut leaves that have been tied together, the men encircle the school of fish that visit seasonally. The fish are corralled into a special giant woven basket, which is hauled onto the beach. The multitudes of fish are brought up to the land to be counted. After that, they are carefully distributed to all the members of the village under the supervision of the chiefs. Besides the sea, the land is also extremely important for many reasons. Saufusi, or wetlands, are important areas for planting crops in Manua. All families of a village own a portion of the Taufusi in which to grow taro. Breadfruit and green bananas are also important staples providing starch in the salmon diet. These foods are usually cooked in the traditional salmon oven together with other salmon delicacies, such as parusami, made from young taro leaves and coconut cream. Manua is rich in legends of their ancient past. They were, according to Samoan legend, the first islands of Samoa that the ancient progenitor god Tangaloa Langi created, making them politically significant to Samoa. One Manua oral tradition tells how Muriava was used as a refuge over a millennium ago. A couple from the village of Fangai on Ta'u Island were set adrift in a small boat as a punishment from their chief. After a few days, they were washed ashore onto Muriava. There, on Muriava, the woman, who had been pregnant at the time, gave birth to a son. The son grew up on the atoll listening to stories of his parents' cruel punishment and vowed to someday seek revenge on the offending chief in Ta'u. When he was grown, he built a boat and sailed to Ta'u, where he subdued the offending chief and became a great leader of the people. 
Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. Ethnographer Micah van der Rijn shares more of his documentary about Muliava. You know, and a lot of uh, American Samoa seabirds are actually hatched there. So it's a source of bird, you know, birds for the whole territory of American Samoa. A, a, a nursery area of sorts for the right. birds. Right, as well as the green sea turtles, correct. Is that a booby? Yeah, that's one of the booby birds. There's like four species of them on the island. For millennia, the people of Manua have had an important relationship with this atoll and its inhabitants, the birds and other life that reside here. While fish, clams, and coral proliferate in the lagoon, above the waterline, it is birds that dominate. Here is where many of American Samoan seabirds hatch, either in nests in the trees or underground. So right now I'm seeing um, a lot of uh, eggs with the, without the, the mothers, and then there's uh, hatching there. But um, one of the things is because the people of Manua because no one's allowed to go there without special permission and getting that permission is also hard. One of the things that was done by the agencies involved was to organize a trip so that um, chiefs and citizens and school children of Manua would have the chance to visit this mm -hmm. island that's part of their, their link to uh, and to renew that link, which is also what the film was about, renewing the link. Uh -huh. so, um, so the film also documents the trip there and so we, you know, and people being there and seeing and learning about it. After six hours at Muliava, it was time to head back home. The trip to Muliava has revitalized Manua's links to their atoll and stimulated new interests among the younger generation. The project of documenting Manua's oral histories and traditional uses of their atoll, which is known by three names, Muriaba, Nuoman, and Rose, has illuminated the importance of the atoll to the people of Manua and Samoa as a whole. Perpetuating those traditions as a living heritage goes hand in hand with preserving the ecological health of the atoll and its surrounding waters. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. 
You mentioned ethnography, mm -hmm. and it, that is the preservation and the understanding of that cultural heritage? Right. Um, ethnography is kind of the systematic description as well as interpretation of a culture. So it's based on participant observation as well as interviews. And um, it's systematic and it's semi-scientific and trying to do it in as le least biased way as possible. We start training people how to document their own culture for the sake of heritage preservation for the future. Particularly um, nowadays with all the imported television, the, um, there's less storytelling. You know, there's a huge, rich rapport of oral history and traditions that are told, and there used to be a tradition of telling them at night from older generation to younger generation. But now that that has declined because of such things as television, as well as modern education, and the value of it is harder to um, realize. So this program was to document and put it in the film form and actually get some of that on the television as well as in the classroom so that the heritage can continue. And you actually have your PhD in ethnography. Correct, and it's actually social anthropology, but ethnography is like the main thing you do as a social anthropologist. It's the main method. So yeah. what was your dissertation research about? Oh, um, well I do have a, a copy <laughs> of it here. And it's, um, it's about changing someone's architecture. So yeah, the title is The Difference Walls Make. So really this main focus was an anthropology of architecture. How does our built forms, the design and uh, spaces that we live in oh. daily connect to our, our culture, who we are, how we conceive of social relationships, because we live in space and, right. we, and our social relationship is also a spatial relationship as well. So how do people manipulate and use architecture spatially to help reinforce social relationships that are then part of their culture. And then because the, the architecture has witnessed dramatic changes over the last uh, 65 years especially, uh -huh. how has that affected the culture and what has driven those changes? That was kind of the focus. And do you have any hope that, like I see, I mean just naively looking at the three images here that this one's very round and open and then the middle one is, is more angular but right. also still open and then we've gone to a full closed. Yeah. Do you hope that maybe by understanding the changes that people can start to, they would build more in, in this type of Yeah, that, that is my hope because I really love the traditional form. It's also much more um, energy efficient uh -huh. and climate responsive. It looks beautiful. And I know that Samoans also themselves really appreciate the traditional form, but there's a lot of socioeconomic factors that have really driven this change. Um, and it's less, the study includes both American Samoa and Western Samoa, so the change has been a bit less over there. It's been greater here. Hurricanes have contributed to it. But I also, um, when the hurricanes wiped out a lot of villages starting in 1966, uh, FEMA, which is a Federal Emergency Management Agency came in and offered to rebuild houses, uh -huh. cement square houses, which people took advantage of, right? But uh, traditionally they would have rebuilt their houses. Um, they're pretty strong houses, but in my study I also found out that a lot of these European, they call them European style houses, they're enclosed with walls uh -huh. rather than open. Um, they use either wood or cement. They actually, a lot of them got more damaged than the traditional houses. Even the very um, just hut style houses, not a fancy Samoan traditional house, but just a small, what they call falio'o, was more intact. I have plenty of pictures I did, photographic documentation of that. And so, because it took, you know, the traditional form developed over several thousand years, and of course they were experiencing hurricanes, they developed a culture, and they, they, it was a response to their climate, the weather, and their cultural development that this particular form developed. But because of cha changing uh, in econ economy with people um, switching to wage jobs and migrating overseas, there's less labor around, that people want the faster, quicker way that uses money. And nowadays, the imported materials become more available, more easily mm -hmm. accessed, especially in American Samoa than in um, than they were before. So that's, and then when the government agencies come in and offer to build it for sure. you, <laughs> this particular form, then that really does some damage to the traditional form. So yes, I definitely wanted to 
promote, as you said, the understanding of the traditional form and appreciation for it, and to look at how it connects to less tangible aspects of the culture and social relationships. For example, um, social relationships in a wallless house are different than in a house sure. enclosed with walls. You have less interaction between like inside and outside, F social interaction as well as physical interaction. So this um, title, The Difference Walls Make, is indicating one of the main changes that I looked at, the addition of walls, as you can see all the way down here. And this, this picture just shows half the house is open in the front and the back half has been enclosed in this. It's all the house. The whole house is enclosed and the windows are also getting smaller and smaller. That's another thing I've noticed. Because of this, you have more dependence on air conditioning, mm -hmm. which is driving up the costs of living. Um, and you also have less kind of social and physical interaction between the indoors and the outdoors. And when you add rooms within the house, you also decrease sort of social act interaction within the house. Sure, traditionally, um, you didn't build uh, you rather than having rooms, a family built additional houses. Oh. So like the, the chief might have the main house with his wife and maybe unmarried daughters and then an adult son and his wife would have another small house and et cetera. So th there would be a additional structures built on the compound and everyone would maintain a relationship between themselves, between their structures and that relationship between themselves is called va in someone. It's the space or relationship between people and it becomes really clear if you're in one house and you're looking at the other house over there and the other people you are conscious of that relationship and that space but if you have rooms and walls you could just forget whoever else is on the other side of the wall <laughs> that was the kind of main thesis that was going on but also the change from round to square what were the implications of that and um, implications of other things the height of the roof the, and many uh, many many other factors yeah. <laughs> oh, is that you? Yes, when I came, when I was 11, I lived with a Samoan family. It made me interested in anthropology because I understood there's different ways of living, different values, uh, ways of, you know, the buildings, the daily life, the way you secure your food can be very different. So that's what I experienced. Coming in, I am identified a lot with Samoan culture, but I'm out, an outside person, though I'm married into it. I think it's important for the people to be able to tell their own stories using the newest media, which is digital. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason I came here, rather than just staying outside and making films about the place. And then those films go out, but they don't get used as much within the local community. So that was the connection I was working on by being here. <laughs> Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant.